gosh, I'm so dramatic. Whew. Hello everyone, this is Jen and I make useful English Lit study videos on Shakespeare, poetry, fiction, literary devices and more to help you get top grades in the subject. So I've recently received lots of requests for Othello topics and I posted a poll last week asking you guys which of the Othello topics and themes you'd most like to see my analysis on and feminism and misogyny ended up as the clear winner so that's what we're going to be focusing on in this video today. So by the way, I have another related video on this topic, which is a character analysis on Desdemona, specifically on whether or not we should see her as the victim or if there's more to her that meets the eye. I highly recommend that you watch that as well if you're interested in the portrayal of women in Othello. And you can check that out here. Or, or here. Here? Here. Anyway, you can check that out up, up here somewhere. But anyway, in this video, we are going to be exploring the representation of women from a broader perspective and look at how female characters like Desdemona, Amelia, and Bianca are less so victims of misogyny as they are perhaps targets of gendered assumptions and willful ignorance by men and their society. So as always, I aim to take a fresh perspective on every text that we study and read. So this is analysis that we probably won't find anywhere else. So if you want top grade ideas on Othello, make sure that you watch till the very end of this video. So in Elizabethan England, the status of women was basically one massive irony. Because on the one hand, you had a childless female monarch at the helm, but for 99% of women with neither blue blood nor royal title to their name, they were pretty much deemed inferior by the society. They were excluded from schools, trades, and most professions, and for the most part, they were expected to be wives and homemakers. So of course, no women could own any property, and just as daughters were the possessions of their fathers, so wives were the property of their husband. So despite the presence of a matriarch ruler, patriarchy was very much the social norm back in Elizabethan and Renaissance England. So in the world of theatre, there were no actresses, only actors, because women were, of course, not allowed on stage. Instead, young boys would often take on female roles. So it's all the more interesting to consider the dramaturgical dynamics of scene that perhaps present romantic intimacy between male and female characters, like the case in Romeo and Juliet, because in reality, that would be between two male actors, and as such, that creates possibilities for homoerotic readings. Or perhaps we can think about the dynamics of scene when female characters like Amelia inveigh against philandering husbands and morally loose men, because in reality, that would be a man, a male actor, criticizing a member of his own sex, and thus inspiring opportunities for introspection. But given the relative powerlessness of women in Shakespeare's time, what we'd understand as misogyny today would have been par for the course. So today, no man in any liberal democratic society would be able to get away with calling a woman insulting names, at least definitely not openly. Back in patriarchal Elizabethan England, people wouldn't really bat an eyelid at men bandying about terms like whore, strumpet, and harlot, etc. So this is why if we wanted to argue that Othello is a misogynistic play, or a play that disrespects women, well, I don't think so, but for the sake of my example, let's just assume, but simply saying that male characters like Othello, Iago, and Cassio hurl insults at women wouldn't make for a very strong argument. Far from normalizing this kind of behavior, Shakespeare perhaps suggests through the men's crude, frequent, and casual typecasting of women in this play, that this reductive impulse to assume that all women would somehow fall within a specific type, i.e. a whore or a goddess, is perhaps a key cause for misunderstanding and tragedy in the play. Now notice that throughout the play, all male characters are very quick to impose their own assumptions when dealing with the women around them. As we go on to analyze each female character in Othello, we'll also see that their characterization is at times colored and sometimes even distorted by the men's narratives. And often these women suffer for not living up to these imposed and often false narratives created by men. Now, for instance, Desdemona is assumed to be this goddess, this perfection personified. But when she reveals herself to be human, she is punished for somehow misleading the men who are wrong about her in the first place because they have put her on this impossible pedestal. And Amelia is assumed to be this dumb, compliant hag. But when 
when she reveals her assertive nature by standing up to her husband's villainy, she is murdered for being a disobedient wife. Finally, Bianca is assumed to be no more than a courtesan who only cares about having sex with men for money. But when she reveals that she actually loves and cares for Cassio, she is met with nothing more than derision and disbelief. Let's now examine the assumptions which are imposed on each of these female characters in the play and look at how each of them are made to suffer as a result of daring to challenge these assumptions. start of the play, Shakespeare seems to present Desdemona as the strong-willed female character who speaks her mind and goes after what or who she wants. The monologue that she gives in defiance of her father's disapproval of her marriage to Othello is resolute, logical and fiercely self-assured for the most part. However, if we look at the way her monologue is introduced and dovetailed by Othello's speech, we'll see that her voice and representation are framed within her husband's narrative superstructure. Notice that in Othello's self-defense, he speaks mostly of how she, which refers to Desdemona, responded to him. But in doing so, he fashions his wife from his perspective and presents to us, the audience, a unique version of Desdemona before we even get to hear from the woman herself. My story being done, she gave me for my pain a world of sighs. She swore in faith, twas strange, twas passing strange, twas pitiful, twas wondrous pitiful. She wished she had not heard it, yet she wished that heaven had made her such a man. She thanked me. This was surely strange, if not also a bit ironic, that in a speech where the man is supposed to be defending himself, he invokes the woman more so than he refers to himself. What's also interesting is the way Othello introduces his wife at the end of the speech when he says, here comes the lady, let her witness it. Now the word witness here means to testify or validate. So in other words, Othello expects his wife to echo the statement, not to share her own thoughts on the matter. And so when Desdemona gets to share her side of the story, she shows that, in fact, contrary to Othello's claim that she loved me for the dangers I had passed, she loves him for a rather different reason. And as she ever so gently refutes her husband's assumption about her motivation for marrying him, she says that I did love the more to live with him. My downright violence and storm of fortunes may trumpet to the world. My heart subdued even to the very quality of my lord. I saw Othello's visage in his mind, and to his honour and his valiant parts did I my soul and fortunes consecrate. So we see then that Desdemona loves Othello because, well, he's Othello. And this is what she means by the very quality of my lord, i.e. she loves him for his essence, his uniqueness, for the person that he is. But as celebratory as this moment may seem from the outset, it's ripe with tragic dramatic irony, because we see that this is a marriage that's in fact born out of problematic assumptions, because the husband assumes the wrong reason for why his wife married him in the first place, while the wife assumes that her husband is much more confident in himself than he actually is. Because when Desdemona says, I saw Othello's visage in his mind, she doesn't know that Othello, in fact, doesn't see his visage in a favourable way at all. There's also the sense that Desdemona decides that her role in the marriage is going to be subsidiary to her husband. As the hyperbaton of the final two lines, and to his honour and his valiant parts did I my soul and fortunes consecrate, shifts the syntactical dominance to the man's elements, i.e. his honour, his valiant parts, and in turn relegates the woman's decision and action to the latter half of the sentence, which is the line about her soul and fortunes consecrate. And also the woman's part literally comes after the one about the man's honours and valiant parts. And so in a syntactical way, the secondary positioning is also reflected. So just as the opening of the play reveals the erroneous assumptions that Othello holds about his wife, the play ends with a painful echo of the couple's public avowals when Othello piles on the vilifying insult of Desdemona being this public commoner, strumpet, and whore, when he confronts 
tells her about her supposed infidelity. Now pay attention to how many times Othello insults her in the following moment. Was this fair paper, this most goodly book, made to write whore upon? What committed, committed, O oh thou public commoner, impudent scrumpet? My heavens, you do me wrong. Are you not a scrumpet? No, as I am a Christian, if to preserve this vessel for my lord from any other foul unlawful touch be not to a strumpet, I am blood. What? Not a whore? No, as I shall be saved. Is it possible? <laughs> oh, heaven forgive us! <laughs> I cry you mercy, then. I took you for that cunning whore of Venice that married with Othello. Now note that Othello's linguistic tendency at this moment is to either metaphorize or typecast his wife. She is either an inanimate object, this fair paper, this most goodly book, or a degenerate category, public commoner, strumpet, cunning whore, etc. Also, all of Othello's questions here are rhetorical questions, which suggests that he's not interested actually listening to what his wife has to say about her actions, but rather he's already made up his mind about what she must have done, which is cheap on him, because of who he perceives her to be, i.e. a strumpet. Even as Desdemona tries to get down to factual details by asking real clarifying questions like, to whom my lord, with whom, how am I false? Or what ignorant sin have I committed? She's ultimately cornered by her husband's refusal to untether himself from his assumptions. As a result, she must resort to a series of limp, powerless rebuttals like, no, as I'm a Christian, no, as I shall be saved. And finally, of course, she is consigned to the fate of absolute silence by death. And even right before Othello plans to kill her, he clings onto his baseless assumptions about Desdemona, giving her handkerchief to Cassio without any intention of hearing her out, thus again assuming that whatever comes out of her mouth must be dishonest because, well, a strumpet is by nature a dishonest character. Peace and be still. I will so. What's the matter? That handkerchief which I so loved and gave thee, thou gavest to Cassio. No, by my life and soul. Send for the man and ask him. Sweet soul, take heed, take heed of perjury. Thou art on thy deathbed. Why won't Othello send for the man and ask him, but instead carry on with his pronouncement of Desdemona's impending death? It's because he doesn't want to risk the possibility of his assumption being proved wrong. And perversely, his assumption about Desdemona's unfaithfulness has become so great that to have it be proven false would absolutely shatter his ego, which would amount to a de facto death on his part. So either way, death is on the table, and it's either his or the woman's. So it's apt then that the last straw for Othello should be yet another false assumption he makes about his wife which is that Desdemona cries out of sadness for Cassio's injury. Oh, my fear interprets, but is he dead? Had all his hairs been lies, my great revenge had stomach for them all. Alas, he is betrayed and I am undone. Out, strumpet, weeps thou for him to my face? Oh, banish me, my lord. But kill me not. Down, strumpet! Oh my god, I'm so dramatic. Now what we see from these moments then is that there's an inextricable relationship between a man's misguided assumptions about women and his inclination to use misogynistic insults. In fact, they share a causal relationship. It's the stereotypical nature of these insults, like strumpet or whore, that gives life to these reductive assumptions about women. Repetition here plays a key role because the more Othello casts his wife in this reductive light of a strumpet and the more he reaffirms her whorish identity through verbal repetition, the more convinced he becomes of his wife's supposed 
culpability. And in his mind, Desdemona equals strumpet. And because a strumpet is defined as a sexually immoral woman who cheats, then regardless of whatever she says, he can only see her according to the limiting definition of the type he has mentally cast her in. By the way guys, I'd massively appreciate it if you could hit the thumbs up button below, subscribe to my channel and switch on that bell notification if you find this video helpful so far. This would really help me carry on making these useful English Lit Study videos so that you can get top grades in the subject and we can inspire more people to enjoy the study of literature. Now, what do the men in the play assume about Amelia? Perhaps a more interesting question is to ask, what do we, the audience, assume about Amelia? Now, in Act 2, Scene 1, when Desdemona, Iago, and Amelia banter about the nature of male and female relationships, Amelia comes across as somewhat of a pushover who has no choice but to swallow her husband's disdain for women. In the face of Iago's complaints about her nagginess and garrulousness, Amelia says very little, which perhaps makes her husband's accusations ironic. We'll see this after Cassio kisses Amelia's hand when Iago says, Sir, would she give you so much of her lips as of her tongue she oft bestows on me? You'll have enough. Alas, she has no speech. In faith, too much. I find it still, when I have list to sleep, marry before your ladyship. I grant she puts her tongue a little in her heart and chides, thinking, you have little cause to say so. And later, when Yago insults women in general for being lazy but also sexually voracious, all Amelia can say is, you shall not write my praise. Now at this point, the audience is probably going to assume that Amelia is the subservient character and modern day feminists will no doubt be fuming over the woman's weakness. And Amelia's sparse responses also create the impression that she's a submissive wife who will just take whatever abuse comes her way. And so later in the play, we're all the more surprised when she delivers that impassioned, indignant trap about her husband should be responsible for their wives' faults. And perhaps even more so when she stands up to her husband in defense of Desdemona's good name and refuses to stay silent about Iago's villainy. What's also ironic is that Desdemona should remark, alas, she has no speech, which means, oh my god, why is she not saying anything? Because in Act 4, Desdemona will be on the receiving end of a long, eloquent speech from Amelia about the need for gender parity in marriage. So dramatically, the structural contrast that Shakespeare establishes between the taciturn, submissive Amelia at the start and a much more trenchant, assertive Amelia towards the end is significant for our understanding of how women are often the victim of cultural assumptions, which can often be even more toxic than blunt misogyny. Just as Iago comments on the difference between women in public and women in private, when he says, you are pictures out of doors, bells in your parlours, and wild cats in your kitchens. So Shakespeare makes a similar point about women having multiple dimensions to them, but in the sense that what they project to the world, for example, a subservient wife who doesn't openly disagree with her husband, may not be who they truly are within. A strong-willed woman who sticks to her guns and refuses to compromise on principles when push comes to shove. So it's all the more poignant then that upon Amelia's discovery of her husband's lie about the handkerchief, which ultimately leads to Desdemona's death, Amelia points out her divided duty, which is that between obeying her husband and speaking her truth. You told a lie! An odious damned lie! Upon my soul, a lie! A wicked lie! She falls with Cassio! Did you say with Cassio? With Cassio, mistress. Go to! Charm your tongue. I would not charm my tongue. I am bound to speak. My mistress here lies murdered in her bed. And your reports have set the murder on. What? Are you mad? I charge you. Get you home. Good gentlemen, let me have leave to speak. Tis proper I obey him, but not now. Perchance, Iago, I will never go home. And note that in Act 2, when Iago 
Hugo accuses his wife of lippiness and of talking too much, Emilia also thought this accusation untrue, but she didn't really bother rebuking him much back then. By this point in the play, though, having seen how Emilia can be incredibly vocal about forces close to her heart, we know that her early reticence isn't really an indication of submissiveness, but simply a reflection of mature indifference over trivialities. On matters of principle, however, this is a woman who will speak up even at the expense of her life. And yet, despite Amelia's brave revolt against her husband, she must still request permission from the good gentlemen around her to let me have leave to speak. She also sees the need to acknowledge that as a dutiful wife, it is proper I obey him, but only in theory. Because on this occasion, proper or not, Amelia can no longer stay within that socially prescribed role of an obedient wife who accepts wholesale her husband's actions. Some feminist critics may even argue that the true hero, or in this case heroine, of the play is Amelia, who sacrifices her life for a truly valiant cause, all the while demonstrating the authenticity and complexity of real women, which counters the impulse of reductive stereotyping that so many of the men in Othello demonstrate. Finally, we get to Bianca, whose role in the play may seem kind of redundant at first, but upon closer examination, we see that she functions as a magnifying glass for just how far women, and especially marginalized women, could be reduced to stereotypes and abstractions. As a courtesan, Bianca doesn't have the most reputable job in the world, true, but at no point in the play does Shakespeare present her in a derogatory or immoral light. She is, however, referred to repeatedly by Argo in the most dehumanizing and disdainful terms, and used by Cassio as his disposable companion whose emotions are not really given much consideration. Everyone assumes that Bianca is a purely transactional figure, quote, a housewife that by selling her desires buys herself bread and clothes, in Iago's words. Bread and clothes here are metonyms for practical goods, while selling and buy are examples of mercenary diction, all of which suggest that Bianca is only after Cassio for nothing more than material and bodily needs. And from Bianca's emotional reaction to Cassio being hurt by Rodrigo in Act 5, we see that she actually cares for him, and that for all the public perception of her being no more than this whore, she is to use her rebuke against Amelia, quote, no strumpet, but of life as honest as you that thus abuse me. So she is presented as a woman with emotional depth and pluck, not just some sexual object to be used and abused at men's pleasure. And despite attempts at typecasting her as no more than a whore, Bianca's vocal protests expose the hypocrisy of a society that seems righteous on the outside, but is actually often more immoral than a supposed prostitute. And interestingly, when Bianca cries, Alas, he faints! Oh, Cassio, Cassio, Cassio! Bianca echoes the tricolor repetition of Cassio's lament early in the play, when Othello demotes him for being part of a drunken brawl. Reputation, reputation, reputation! Oh, I have lost my reputation. I have lost the immortal part of myself. And what remains is bestial. Now, when we juxtapose Bianca and Cassio's statements, we see that while Cassio sees the loss of his reputation as being social suicide, Bianca is someone who doesn't care at all about his professional standing. And instead, she loves him as a whole person, as just Cassio the man. And even though he hurts her by asking her to take out the work of what she suspects to be some minx's token, or when he treats her as a side chick whom he can just beckon and command at will. This is, in a way, similar to Desimona's reason for loving Othello. She loves him for the very quality of my lord, but, and she accepts the man in his entirety, even though he subjects her to numerous kinds of verbal and physical abuse. It is ironic as well that out of all the women in the play, only Bianca, who is the actual professional strumpet, speaks out against being called a strumpet, as when she says, I am no strumpet, but a life as honest as you that thus abuse me. But it's also worth considering that, unlike Desdemona and Amelia, Bianca is the only female character who 
doesn't die by the time the play concludes. Is she simply too unimportant to meet such a tragic fate? Or is there also a suggestion that the woman who is least embarrassed about standing up to false allegations, throwaway insults, and wrongful assumptions will ultimately be the survivor of the fittest, especially in a society where women are systemically misunderstood by men anyway? So perhaps the women in Othello are admirable and daring in that they all seek to challenge the cultural assumptions lodged against them by the men in their lives. However, it's perhaps part of the tragic impact that Shakespeare should have Desdemona and Amelia, the two main female characters, suffer for being the subject of such assumptions. And despite putting up a good fight, they are ultimately defeated by these very assumptions which have unjustly defined them. At the end of the day, then, perhaps it's more rewarding to consider Desdemona, Amelia, and Bianca not as the victims of misogynistic impulses, but more as martyrs of proto-feministic instincts in an age where feminism has yet to enter the mainstream consciousness. And thank God it has. And that's it for this video, guys. I hope that my analysis of Women in Othello gives you some refreshing insights into the play and that it helps you level up your revision. Don't forget to check out my Othello playlist, which I'll link to in the description box below, where you'll find resources to help you get top grades on your next Othello essay or exam. As always, please do hit the thumbs up button below if you like this video and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, so you don't miss out on any of the top grade English Lit Study videos I'll be posting on a weekly basis. And I'll see you guys in the next one.